Yeah, uh, first, thanks to Markus uh, for uh, finding really good speakers again, like always. And um, yeah, as you can see here on the slide, I'm uh, from an external antivirus company oh. named Gedata. Um, yeah, maybe first of all, my name is Carsten Thelmer. And I'm happy to be here uh, every time when we have an invited speaker here. Um, basically, we are supporting, as a company, we are supporting this course uh, since many terms now. And that means uh, we are offering an additional evening event every time we have an invited speaker here. Um, that means after the talk and after all the small discussions here, we invite all of you which are interested to come uh, to our location, which is close by. You can see the details of the dress here, but if you have any further questions, you can come to me after the talk. Um, we are offering a nice dinner with three really delicious main courses, a nice and cozy atmosphere, and the basic idea behind it is that um, we want to give you the opportunity, first of all, to get closer, in closer contact to the speakers. So today with Matthias, and um, in, in the end, if you have deeper questions to the talk or his job in general and everything, there's a really good place for it. On the other hand, um, a lot of our technical guys, some are already here to enjoy the talk, but uh, most of them and others will come to the dinner event as well. So if you're interested in uh, talking to people from antivirus uh, industry, especially if you want to talk to more technical oriented people and not to the sales guys, <laughs> uh, then this is a really good place and I can, rec can recommend it. Um, a few of us also studied here, so maybe this is also an option to talk to people who have this background from studying here and going to this field, uh, industry field to see a little bit more what can you do, what could be interesting, what would be boring, I don't know. So um, I'd like to invite all of you. If you have any further questions, just come to me after the talk. And now I'd like to give over the bar to Matthias. Okay. Let's uh, give him a warm welcome, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Uh, first of all, thanks to Markus for inviting me. So it's my second time here. And as he said, again, it's Java, but this time not on the client side, but on the server side. And the talk today is about um, Java deserialization vulnerabilities. Um, before we start, I just want to let you know what code wide is, what a, who I am, and why I give this talk. And then we'll go into the deeper stuff. First question, is anyone or every one of you able to read a little bit of Java code? OK, perfect. Because I have some slides with Java, it's pretty easy because I really have to focus on the serialization, uh, serialization stuff, but you need to understand Java a little bit. Okay, so let's switch to presentations. So first of all, about CodeWide. So we are a pen test and security research company. We are based in Ulm. And what we do is we are checking corporate, uh, corporate infrastructures in red teams. So usually a party of two or three for three or four weeks. So not uh, just a pen test for one web application, but usually if you have a client, it's usually a DAX company, uh, we have the right to hack everything. And usually the goal is to get something like domain admin. Um, that's why we also have a strong focus on post exploitation. So usually getting the initial hop for huge companies easy. You always find easy systems like dev system or integration systems where you get a, sh uh, where you get a shell. Uh, but we also love to use zero days just to get the initial hop. For example, if you have a web application and it's, you can download it, you look into the code, for example, Java, and you find a deserialization bug there. So, and AV is our best friend. Maybe some of you have seen our um, blog post about uh, one big AV company where we looked into the uh, management interfaces. And of course, we are always looking for candidates. So if you're interested, just let us know. About me, so I'm the head of vulnerability research at CodeWide, and I'm doing technical security now for six years. And I'm worked as a Java dev, let's say, I think three years or four years or something like that. And realized, OK, I do, uh, do really want to do something different. I want to do security. And then I worked for Daimler TSS. And then we, I went to CodeWide. Um, 
I like to find easy bugs in Java. Java is easy because you always have context, except on Android. But if you decompile Java, you have the code. It's easy. And I have found uh, vulnerabilities in Oracle, IBM, Symantec, Apache, Adobe, Atlasin, and so on. Usually all the server-side stuff, because my work was always on the server-side currently. Uh, and recently I do more client-side stuff, and also low-level, so more awesome and reversing. Okay, um, yeah, and you can reach me on Twitter uh, under my handle, Matthias Kaiser. Why this talk? So deserialization vulnerabilities are less known and, exp and exploited compare, uh, compared to uh, PHP unserialized. I think you all have seen any vulnerabilities in applications where unser unserialized is exploited. If you want to have seen an example, just look on our blog. Uh, Markus Wolftange has a good write-up uh, write on an unseril uh, unserialized vulnerability in PHP. But I think on the Java side, it's, not a, it's pretty new, it's a new class. And it's a dedicated bug class, so, which means um, if you see such a vulnerability, it really is something unique. There are only some research, uh, researchers uh, who disclose the details on, on the vulnerabilities. For example, Takeshi Terada, uh, he's from MBSD, I think, a Japanese company, David Yorm. Uh, Gabriel Lawrence and Chris Rohoff. So I think there are some more, but these are the most uh, important ones. And the deserialization vulnerabilities are very, are very easy to spot. That's one of the interesting things you will see later. And if you want to exploit them, it's also very easy if you have to write libraries in the class path. I spent roughly about, I think, three or four weeks on doing some research on the topic. I looked at uh, products of Oracle, Atlas and Apache, and so on, and one of the vulnerabilities I will show today, and there are more to come. And they are all remote code executions without any authentication. Okay, and there's a disclaimer. So this talk is not about, um, uh, no, this is not a reference on serialization. There's a spec and there's also a serialization protocol. If you want to know details, just go on the Sun or Oracle website. You can look up everything. It's pretty good. And this talk is not about sandbox escapes. So using deserialization for sandbox escapes, it's really on the server side. And I also won't cover in this talk um, special or special libs or frameworks doing serialization. For example, there's a library very common in the Java field. It's extreme. I won't cover it here. Although you can apply, oh, too fast. Also, you can apply um, at least the exploit vectors, which I show here also to extreme, which is pretty good. Okay, and that's the agenda for today. First of all, I want to show you what serialization is. And then what's the issue with serialization? how to exploit it, where's serialization used. And I think that's only one slide, but it's maybe very important for you because if you want to look for bugs, it will help you where to look for. And then we have a case study. It's one of my CVEs. It's, I think it was patched one, one week ago. It's Atlas in Bamboo. And it's a very easy vulnerability and I think you will like it because <laughs> it's just great. Okay, what is serialization? Um, there's a nice um, definition on, on the Oracle web page. It's from the guys who, who do GNDI, uh, JNDI. It's the Java Naming Directory uh, service or interface, I think. So. Um, to serialize means uh, an object, no, to serialize an object means to convert its state to a byte stream so that the byte stream can be reverted back into a copy of the object. So you just take the object, do something on it and you will get a byte stream of it, which is the representation of the object. And if you want to get back the object, you take the byte stream, read it in, and suddenly you have the object back in your JVM. That's the way. I have a small example for it. So we have a person class, which implements the interface serializable. So every class which wants to get serialized uh, needs to implement this interface. We have a serial version UID, it's like a version number. 
So for example, if you have a newer version of, of this object and you send it over the network to somebody and it gets deserialized, you will get an exception if the version number does not fit or is the same. And we have in the object the name and a birth date. So name is of type string and we have uh, the birth date of type date. So date is a complex object. object. Okay, and then we have then we have the main. So we, have, we create a person object there. We assign a name to the person object. It's Matthias Kaiser and we put a birth date there, which is yeah, a nice number. By the way, I'm not born in 1970, but 1979. So it's almost 1970, I think so. And what we do there is we take uh, an API, cl API, API class of um, the serialization API which is called object output stream. And what we do is we take the object output stream, use another file output stream, and write the object to the temp person dot bin file. And therefore we use the, uh, the method write object. So we take this object P and write it into the file temp person. So the question is, how does it look like? Uh, 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 uh. And it looks like this. So you see a lot of bytes. There, there's a magic number, ACED. If you see this magic number somewhere in a file on the network, you know what to do later on. You need to exploit it. <laughs> yeah, so that's the typical way. Um, if you see the ASCII character for ACED, it's, I think, something like this. And whenever we see it in our company, oh, not again, serialization. <laughs> because we are always looking for products which are vulnerable. Um, if you look into the stream, you see the person, the birth date, and you see my name here, Matthias Kaiser, and you should also see here the birth date, 1337. Okay, that was the way we take the object and transfer it into a byte stream. Let's look onto the other side. We take the byte stream, you already know it. We have a different program here. So we're using the object input stream to read it in. We are taking again the same file, which is temp person.bin. And what we do now is we read the object. We call a magic method called read object on the object input stream. And then we show and then we print just the birth date and the name. Okay, and then we have the, uh, that we have my name and also the birth date. That's it, that's serialization. So there are two, uh, two things to remember. Look for object input stream and look for read objects. That's it. So as I said, object output stream writes down the object. There are methods on this, on this uh, class like write an object, write in char, write an UTF string, write an integer, write in short and so on. Or write in complex object like write object. And object input stream has a default implementation how the objects are represented. It, um, the reprint, uh, representation is according to the uh, Java serialization specification, I think that's the name for it. Um, and what, happening, what is happening there is um, they take the object and they traverse it and look for complex object, go to the complex object, write down all primitive values, and then go to the next object, write down the primitive values, and so on. So it's just going through the gar a graph, and writing down all the primitive values. And then we have the object input stream, which does the same thing, but reverse. So it reads from an input stream, and we have the methods read object, read jar, read integer, read short, and so on. Okay. Um, customizing serialization. A, a developer has the chance to customize the behavior. For example, he does not want to have the object serialized like in the, um, in the specification. He can customize it. And therefore he can implement two methods on the object to be serialized. In our case, it's the person object. So he can re uh, implement the write replace method, which just replaces the object which should be serialized and we have the write object method 
where he has full control of what really gets into the stream. For example, he's saying, oh, now I don't want to have the name in it. I just want to write down, I don't know, the birth date or whatever. So you can really customize everything there. Um, during deserialization, we have the same possibilities. We have read object, full control of what will be read in. And then we have the method uh, read resolve, which is the same as write object, replacing a deserialized object with another one. Um, I will skip in my examples the write object, the write replace in the read resolve. But if you're interested, just customize the example and you will see what is happening there. Okay, now we have a bigger example. I hope you can read it. So we have the write object method. In the person, we have the read object method. We have the write replace and the read resolve. And I just re return the object, uh, which, I can, uh, which is currently serialized or deserialized, uh, which is this. And in the write object, what I do is I write down the default object, so the same which we have seen in the beginning. And what I also add to the byte stream is um, I write down the current username who is running the deserialization class, which is system get property user.name. And when we deserialize the person class, what we do is in the read object method, we read in all default values. So we read in the object and then we just write, uh, and then we just write out who was the person or the, the user who is serializing the class. And if you run this, run this example again, I think, yeah, it's the same like in the beginning. And the output will be, oh, where's the output? No output here. Oh, there's missing something, okay. Um, the output will be um, a person who serialized uh, by, and a person was serialized by Kaimat, and then we will see the other stuff like uh, Matthias Kaiser and my birth date. Okay, no, something is wrong here. It doesn't matter. Okay, so and now please think about what can happen if you have a serialized object put into a byte stream and just send it over the network to a server. For example, Java RMI is working on that way. They take an object and send it over network and on the server side, it gets deserialized. Or for example, um, there is um, asynchronous, asynchronous messaging API in Java, which is called JMS. They do the same. It, they take an object, serialize it, send it over the network and on the server side, it gets deserialized. So what's the issue with the topic? So what can happen? First of all, the object input stream class does not check anything. So when it's invoked and it gets a byte stream, it just deserializes it. There's, there are no checks, there's no whitelist, there's no blacklist. The only thing what can happen is that a class gets, uh, an object gets deserialized and later on casted. For example, in our example, we had the person, the person cast. It gets deserialized and a class, a class cast exception will occur. That's the, what can happen, but still the object will be deserialized. So it will be in the JVM, but later on there will be an exception, but it will be there. Um, and of what the most impress, interesting part is, is read object and read resolve, both methods which a developer can customize. Um, they're working on user input they're working on the serialized stream, which means if you send a special stream of bytes to a read object method and it gets deserialized and it's the stream which you control, something nice ha can happen. Of course, it can be abused um, and you will see how it works in details. Uh, I will start with an older vulnerability, which is Apache Commons file upload. It's CVE 2013-2186. Uh, it's a nice one. Um, what I should mention here is um, it's a library which developers are using for doing the file upload thing very easy. So just invoke two, three met or, two or three methods and then you have the post request where the file upload is in. And yeah, that's it. And if you look into the advisory, I think it's from Red Hat. 
There's a class, it's called disk file, I, uh, disk file item, uh, which allows remote attack attackers to write arbitrary files via a null byte in the file name in a serialized instance. So, and there is serialized, okay, that's the keyword we have. And since it is requiring a null byte to be exploited, it only works on Java 740, uh, um, everything under Ch uh, Java 740, or it's not working on Java 8. And if you look into the disk file item class, again, I need to zoom in for you. Um, there's a read object method. And what the read object method is doing is just read the default values of the disk file item and invoke the get output stream method. And the get output stream method, uh, again, the get output stream method calls get temp file. And from there, it's very obvi obvious what the vulnerability is. If we look into the get temp file, you see something, okay, there's a file, it's created. There's a temp deer and a temp file name. Temp file name is something like upload UID, get unique UID. So it's something you not control. But if you go backwards, you see, okay, there's a temp deer and temp deer is assigned to repository. Repository is a member of the disk file item class. So it's a member which is in a serialized stream. So you can influence it. And what you do is, and I think, yeah, repository is of type file. So there's in the file class, there's um, the file path. And if you add something like, I don't know, var, www, whatever, tomcat, what is, and then add something like uh, test.jsp, add a null byte, and everything afterwards, which is format temp file here, will be cut off. That's it. So with this vulnerability, you have a file upload. And the file upload or the file content comes from the stream, from the deserialized uh, stream. Um, I do not have a POC for it here, but I think you can look it up, it's easy to find. Uh, but I have a nicer one for you. How to exploit it? First of all, what you need to do is you need to find classes which invoke object input stream dot read object. What you can do is you just decompi uh, decompile all the jars in an application and grab for it. Or what you can also do is just take Eclipse, add all the jar files of the application to the class path, go into the object input stream class, right click on the read object and say open call hierarchy and you see the huge call hierarchy who's invoking uh, read object. That's a typical way I do. And the question now is how we can get, uh, get remote code execution with that. There are several exploits out, uh, out there. They are not that now in my opinion, um, maybe in context of extreme. There's one uh, for the Spring framework, which is used very often. And it's only working if it's, um, it's older than 3.05 or 2.06. Um, the vulnerability was found in 2011 and it's from a, a guy from the Netherlands. I think his name is Wouter. There's another one, uh, it's Groovy. So the Groovy library, you can find it very often in, in new applications. And the vulnerability is in all versions smaller than or older than 2.44. And the vulnerability was found in 2015, uh, in, in this year, by Gabriel Lawrence and Chris Froho of, of Qualcomm. Um, there's a story about this specific <laughs> vulnerability. Um, during my research time, um, I also looked for the same topic and I also found the Groovy vulnerability and I thought, oh, that's nice. You can use it everywhere where you have crew in the class path. And suddenly I realized uh, in the evening at 10 o'clock when I was looking into my Nexus and reading and I was looking for Wooter's exploit or for his vulnerability, I realized that the guys from Qualcomm already released it on the AppSec Kali uh, this year. So they just had a presentation that was called Marshalling Pickles and they covered, I think, um, Python, Java and Ruby and they just showed it there and said, okay, there's something for Java. And I thought, 
guys, are you serious? That's a very cool vulnerability. Why, why don't you do a talk on its own? Yeah, bad for me. And there's the great one. It's called Apache Commons Collection. Um, excuse me. There is no CVE for it right now. And it's funny because it was disclosed in January. So it's still unpatched. And that's the typical way where <laughs> how I exploit the deserialization vulnerabilities. I just look for a Commons Collection. If I see this class in a class path, it's quick win. And there's more to come. Uh, these vectors are all universal. So it means if you find a read object and if the library is in your class path and if you can supply the input, code execution. Um, I also have a unique one which works in several application servers uh, like JBoss and so on. I can't talk too much about it because it's still in the fixing process but it's also a universal vector and it also works for this type of serialization. It also works in extreme, so it's pretty unique. And hopefully it will be patched. Maybe this or next CPU from Oracle, I don't know. They just announced, okay, it, it's, it's patched in the main line. Um, the guys from Qualcomm, Chris and Gabriel, they also created a nice tool. It's called Why So Serial. Um, <laughs> It's nice, yeah, but you can use it. It just say, okay, uh, run this, uh, create me a serialized object stream, and write it into a file, and I, I, don't, I want to run calc or gnome calculator or whatever, and it creates you the bytes. You take the bytes and do what you want, send it over network, and then you have code execution. So if you are interested in all the exploits here, so the Spring, Groovy, and Apache comments, you can find it in YSO Serial. It's on GitHub from the guys. Okay, and now it gets a little bit more complicated. We will look into how the comments collection um, vector works. Um, the version I'm showing here, it's not the same as in the YSO serial tool. It's a different one because um, I don't want to introduce here what a proxy is. So maybe you have heard of ECMAScript 6, I think, the, proxy, the proxies. It's the same concept. Um, if you have a proxy and if you invoke something on the proxy, it's an object, if you invoke something on that, it will be sent to an invocation handler. I don't want to stress this topic here because it's maybe a topic on its own. Um, the comments collection exploit, it's just awesome because you can find it everywhere. In almost every application or in almost every commercial application in, uh, where I looked into, I found comments collection in the class path. And it was disclosed 274 days ago. It's of course self-executing, which means there's nothing to do on the server side. You just send it and the payload will be executed. And what is happening there is the developers of Commons Collection, like the name says, it's, they, are, they have collection classes. Uh, what they did is they decided to implement very insecure function in, for example, specific maps or sets or lists. And there's, for example, a transformed map class, <laughs> which can be used to invoke methods dynamically using reflection, which is crazy and good for us. And to trigger this vulnerability, we need another class, which is an invocation handler. But as I said, I don't want to tell you what a proxy is and stuff like that. It's just a class which can be deserialized. Okay, let's find out what is happening. And yes, it's very small again. So hopefully you can read it now. Yeah, uh, we have the transform map class and we have two public methods. It's decorate and decorate transform. And maybe you have heard of the decorator pattern from the Gang of Four. And what is happening with the methods here is you have your map, you have some objects in the map and you want to have another map, which is the transformed map, where whenever an object get in, gets into the, into the map or whenever an object is changed into the, in the map, something is invoked or happening or transformed. So it's just um, a map which you put over your map. And yeah, here's the definition of decorate. 
So you, you have the input parameters map and you supply a key transformer and a value transformer. So and whenever you change a value of the map or on a map entry or whenever you change a key on a map entry, the transformers are invoked. Okay. So in changing entries in the, in the map means you call put or put all or you call, um, or you call, yeah, we have it here. Or you call set value on an entry opt on an entry in the map. So, for example, if you have an entry object in the map, it's maybe one entry which is in your map, and you set the value in there. The another method is invoked, which is check set value, and check set value does. Does invoke the value transformer transform. Okay, so what are transformers? Transformers are very easy. Like in the real world, robots, no? Um, they just have a transform method. And what they do is they take an input object and transform it to an output object, not more. And if you want to find out which transformers are in Commons collection, there are a lot of them. Mm. We have a lot of them. We have the chain transformer, we have the clone transformer, we have the uh, invoker transformer, and for example, if I read somewhere in the code invoke, it's usually, uh oh, invoke sounds like a reflection. Could be nice. Okay, and if you look into the invoke, invoker transformer, uh, it's an object which takes <laughs> three parameters, which are method name, parameter type, and args, which sounds like the typical parameters which you use for reflection calls, which are dynamic method invocation calls. And here's the implementation of the transform method. There's an object which comes in and on this method, the method object is, yeah, we, we just get the method object. For this method, for example, you have, you have an object string class, or you have an object from of type string. You set it as input, and we want to, we want to get the two string method. So we just say here, two string, we pass parameters empty, empty, we get the method two string, and later on, we invoke it on the input object. That's the reflection. So we just call two string. And now it gets interesting. I guess you can you can you you already see what is happening here. <laughs> Especially if you read Gnome calculator. Uh, so what we do is we create a chain transformer, which is just a, a chaining several transformers in chain. We say, okay, we want to have in the, a constant transformer, which just returns the runtime object class or the runtime class. We want to invoke the get method on the runtime class and we want to get the method get runtime, which return, and then we have the method object, and then we invoke on the method on object the invoke method, which means we just call runtime get runtime. And if you have a runtime object, you can call the exec method and just pass, uh, pass the parameters, and then you ex execute your operating, operating system command. So we have a transformer which, which executes GNOME Calculator. And what we do now is we create an inner map. So that's the, ma uh, the map where we store something. And I just put in one entry, which is an object with a key value and an object value, which are both of type string. And we create another map, which is the outer map, and it's decorated with the transformer. And whenever we invoke the put, 
or a put all method on our outer map, you can guess what, what is happening. What we can also do is we can get all the entries of the map and set a value on the map entry and the transformer will be invoked and we have a GNOME calculator. Um, yeah, I think I need to speed up a little bit. Okay, so no, dummy, uh, no demo for this, but you can see GNOME calculator. <laughs> <laughs> but not the real one. Okay, so please remember, if you have, if you have such a structure of a class or if you just have all the statements and somebody invokes set value, it means calculator. So the question is how we can get the set value invoked in an, in an read object or read resolve method, which is invoked during deserialization. There's a nice class. It's also found by Chris Frohoff and Gabriel Lawrence. It's called annotation invocation handler. And let's do it a little bit bigger. You see there are two members. We have a type, which is of type class. And we have member values, which, of, which is of type map. Of course, it needs to be a map because we want to invoke something. And they have a constructor, which is not public. It's package private, which means we cannot invoke it very easily, but you will see we can invoke it. And if we go into the, and if we go into the implementation of the read object method of this class, we see, okay, first of all, in the very beginning, the default object will be read in, which is member values and the type, and then something is happening in, in the background, like we, they want to get the annotation type for the type we are supplying here. And then later on, on the annotation type, something is done. But the most important thing is happening here. We have the member values, which we can influence, which can be, for example, be a transformed map. And in the very end, there is a set value on the member values. We need to reach this code path. And that's perfectly p feasible. Um, what we do is we, we take a Java lang annotation target class as the type and we add our transformed map to the serialized stream. And later on, because some checks are working in that way, I don't want to go into details here, but you just try it out. We reach the code path where set value is invoked on member values and member value is of type map entry, which means our transform is invoked. Okay. So, and this is the magic to create the byte stream. Again, we have all the transformers here. We have the chain transformer, which concatenates all together. We have our hash map, the inner map, where we just store value and value. We decorate it, have our outer map. We create an annotation invocation handler object using reflection, which is we try to get the constructor for uh, the constructor for the class here. We get a constructor object. We set it to accessible, which means uh, we can invoke the constructor. Also, um, also it's um, package private, and then we create a new instance using the constructor. And then we have an instance of a notation invocation handler. We take just the object, write it down into us in our stream, and we have a perfect representation of an invocation, uh, a notation invocation handler, which does magic. Okay. And I think that's maybe um, a more, more interesting question for you if you already spend some time on the topic. Um, if you do not have any groovy or comments collections on a glass path, what would you do? Looking for read object and read resolve, doing nasty things. That's the way I did, for example, where I discovered my vector. Um, you also can look for proxies or invocation handler. If you find invocation handlers, it's there's high probability that they're doing nasty stuff. Um, for example, they're doing reflection on user input. 
maybe you can invoke methods on objects. Might be the case. Um, currently, uh, at least I know two research uh, researchers who are working on a topic, and you can, yeah, it's pretty sure that they will present something in 2016, so next year. So there's more to come. And as soon as my vulnerability is fixed, I will also publish it on our blog or on GitHub, I don't know, but at least on our blog. Okay, so where is serialization used? I don't want to stress this topic too much here because it's currently my research area, so I still want to find bugs. Um, everywhere remote method invocation or, or something like that is, is done. For example, we have also found a vulnerability in a very well-known AV management interface. They have running RMI. They have commons collections on the class path, code execution. There are custom RMI IPC protocols. For example, if you have heard of Spring HTTP Invoker, um, they are also doing serialization stuff there. Java management extension, it's on top on RMI, so it's also a good area to look into. For example, JBoss, Tomcat, they all have JMX. And Java messaging service. Okay, now let's look into the case study. It's the vulnerability which was disclosed one week ago. It's Atlas in Bamboo. And just to summarize, it's a critical vulnerability. Uh, Bamboo is affected from version 2.2, which is from 2009 until now. So whenever you see Bamboo anywhere, maybe on the client, also, or maybe in the infrastructure on your um, at your client, it's an easy target. And it's critical, which means it's without authentication. Okay. So what is Bamboo? Bamboo is a continuous build server. If you ever heard of Jenkins or stuff like that, they are cool targets. For example, if, you, if your client is in a software company, and I mean a software company, their asset is source code. So when you get their source code, uh, source code you have their assets. So management will, oh, you have a source code. Uh, and typically on continuous build server, you find a lot of code. And usually they all have credentials uh, credentials to check out the code from, I don't know, Git, wherever. So you also gain uh, cred uh, credentials there, which is good. Uh, uh, and what I did was I just did the typical stuff like look, decompiling and grabbing for read object. And there was one hit. It was uh, a class called deliver message servlet. And I also have the screenshot where is it? Back. From Eclipse, you see I, I pressed right click or right click on read object, and you see the call hierarchy, and there's a deserialize object method. Okay, sounds cool. And <laughs> the best thing is parameters HTTP servlet request. Okay, so you send the HTTP request, and it gets deserialized. Is it that easy? We will see. Okay, there's some, op yeah, there's one obstacle. They have something like a fingerprint, w w um, what they check in the, in the post method. So if you look into the first line, they do request get parameter. So they get from the post request one parameter, which is called fingerprint, and they check it somewhere. And if, if the fingerprint is not fine, they say, uh-oh, 404, bad for us. But if you can get past it, we get into a class, uh, into a method call which is called deserialize object. And the definition of this method is something like this. Object input stream, read object. That's the thing we want. Okay, so we need a valid fingerprint to exploit a vulnerability. And by the way, I forgot to mention they have comments collection on the class path, which is very important. They have comments collection on the class path. So we need a valid fingerprint, and Atlas in Bamboo is using struts. Okay, struts is our own topic, you know, all this ONGL stuff, so fancy reflection magic. But 
doesn't matter now. But they have a uh, get fingerprint method there. And it can be invoked via HTTP, so you just send a request there. And the de definition of the, of the method is get fingerprint here. And the URL is slash agent server. And what is happening if you invoke this URL with H, uh, slash agent server slash get fingerprint, um, the method default or do default will be invoked. And the method do default is pretty easy. Uh, but a little bit long, maybe. So we are on the uh, do default method. So they, they do something like authentication checks there. Okay, so let's do the authentication. Okay, if we are an elastic, it returns true, which we need. Which we need. So what is elastic? Ah, okay. If we have, we have an agent type which is equals elastic, <laughs> we can <laughs> get past the authentication. And what we need is we need to get one of the calls here. And you can see here, if you get past the do authenticate, <laughs> there's another is elastic. So again, we can pass it, setting the agent type to elastic. And I think now it's time for the demo. So let's switch the VMs. And what what I have here is we have the Bamboo instance running. So it's usually running on port 80, 85. So, and here is the, uh, hopefully you can see it, yeah, you can see it. Um, we have the HTTP request, it's a get request. We are calling agent server get fingerprint and supply the agent type equals elastic and just run it. And here is our fingerprint. I think you cannot read it <laughs> in the very back, but there is our fingerprint. And I also have it in the slides. So we just take the fingerprint. Well, uh, okay, I think I have mouse issues again. No! Uh, come on. Maybe with this one? No, not bad. Oh, come on. Are you serious? Ah. Are you serious? Maybe we can do something safe into file. You see, I press here, but I, it's not working. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me see. Do I have the old fingerprint somewhere? Yeah, I have it. Okay, so please trust me. Uh, usually, what I do is I generate the payload. So I invoke this class here. I take. Oh no. The wrong one. I generate a payload. So not again. No, that's wrong. Oh, come on. Okay, so I generate a payload. And what I usually do is I just paste it in here. So we are invoking the post request, which is agent server. We invoke the message, pass the fingerprint, and add our generated payload there, which is an invocation handler, which cons contains a trans uh, transformed map. So it's about, yeah, 1,332 bytes. And now it's time to press the button. And you see calc is popping, which was our goal. And if you, are, if you do not get any feedback in your target systems, um, or, or if you want to check if it really works, you get a class cast exception always because um, the class which the application is expecting is a different one and you always see something like annotation invocation handler there. But it do, usually you do not get any feedback, so you need something like uh, out of bound DNS or stuff like that. Okay, this was the case study and um, this is one of my vulnerabilities. I have uh, at least three or four to come. Oracle, uh, a product of Oracle, uh, a product of Apache, and uh, and 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 an AV vendor, which I don't want to name here. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure that there will be more. So if you really want to find easy bugs and exploit them, look for read object because, as I said, it's a new bug class. Nobody has exploited it. 
look for it. Okay. And now we are at the very end. Uh, it's still not working. I don't know what is happening here. Okay, so questions and answers. 